Welcome, everybody, to the Combo Couch. Pasta Jardula here, and I got a great guest with me. You can see him right next to me. You might have recognized him from America's Got Talent, you know what I'm saying, in the space mask. Uh, I've known this gentleman for quite some time right now. I've seen him out and about in the field when it comes to getting in the, some politicians' face with the good questions. Uh, he's always had great questions. He's got a good little show going on, a nice little setting. He's got a lot of great things to say. With us today is Dan Nauman Nicewinder. I call him Dan Nauman, but his real name is Dan Nicewinder. How are you doing, Dan? I'm doing fantastic, Craig. Thank you for asking. And, and how are you, by the way? Hmm. You know, I'm great. Um, What's going on in the world kind of sucks right now. The Israel-Palestine uh, yeah. situation really is sad. And I think that, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some stuff today. We're going to talk about actually more economics, I think, are going to be the, the bread and butter of what we're talking about. And make no mistake about it, Dan, um, these are conversations that need to be had. But I think it's a four-headed dragon or a several-headed dragon. Not only do we have to deal with our economic problems, we have to deal with our foreign policy, and we have to deal with the technological boom which is, seems to be a way of infringing on our civil liberties and our voices. And uh, it's really changed the whole game. Um, however, you know, you called me up the other day and you were like, hey, man, uh, I've been doing some work with DSA. And I was immediately like, ah, oh, I've been doing some work with Johnny Echeverria. I love that kid. You know, he's a DSA guy, but he, he came on our show a couple months ago uh, and still talked a lot of truths. Uh, and it showed me that even though still, you know, I have this kind of like resentment towards the Democratic Party, DSA, uh, sometimes the Green Party, you know, for their leadership and their lack of leadership, um, there still could be some great work done with inside those movements. Uh, I have got several friends, including yourself and including my good friend, Angel Chapo, I call him, uh, and Johnny Echef Echefaria, who do some amazing work in DSA. But when we started speaking, you said to me, Pasta, really, we have to make some bold moves and we have to convince people that socialism is good uh, and capitalism might not be the way. And I immediately threw up my hands and I said, Dan, 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 I said, please, um, when you say socialism to a person like my mother, she goes running for the cupboard for a knife, you know what I'm saying, a butcher knife or Italian butcher knife. Socialism is bad to a lot of people. They've been brainwashed or they've been duped or they've been confused. So I said, well, really, you know, how are you going to convince people who are so set against this about socialism? And you said to me, Dan, this is what socialism means to me. So I said, let's do a show and let's start speaking about that because there were two things that you said that were just amazing. It's about mutual aid and it's about uh, owner co-opt businesses. Right. Correct. That's right. So let's discuss a little bit about that, because I was watching your show the other day. You have an amazing show. Guys, go to Dan's website, uh, go to his YouTube. Uh, he has a great show on the history of socialism, uh, about an economic bill, goes back to FDR, even kind of ties it into to Bernie. Uh, and Bernie 2016 was really fire. Bernie 2020, another story. Bernie now throw out the baby with the bathwater. Just terrible. Uh, in my personal opinion, sorry if you're still following the man, but uh, he didn't have the, the guff and the oomph in 2016 when he was talking about those eco economic problems and going into Trump towns and saying, hey, listen, this is the economic issue. Let's deal with it. So tell uh, me, Dan, tell our audience what socialism means to you. What socialism means to me is literally where the workers, um, or we could say the general public, in some cases, because you know, when people retire, they're not really technically workers, are the owners of the economy. And when, when that means is that you, uh, there's, a, there's a thing called the dividend that, that they get like in Alaska, you know, because of the oil. Uh, so it's kind of like you've done your part or you're doing your part. You deserve to be able to be the owner of part of that society that you live in, the, which is the economy. The economy is at the base of everything. I did one of the documentaries that I created was called The Roots of Society and the Enlightenment of Solutions. And the roots meaning that everything, like the tree, I compared it to a tree, the, the economics is like the roots of the tree. If you don't have a strong economic system, that tree will not survive. It doesn't matter what kind of fruit or leaves or branches you have on the tree, it won't survive without a strong system of roots in the ground that you can't see even. 
Um, and so I compared that example of the tree to basically to our life on the planet. And that's why even all of the justice, the foreign policy issues you're talking about, everything in our society, all the justice is really under that foundation of, of economics. And that's one of the, the massive transformational realizations I had with Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Los Angeles, was that, oh yeah, the economics really is at the base of all of this. You know, and that just got the wheels turning, you know, because before that time I had just been a media ambassador for a UN program. So I was, you know, um, anti-war or peace is like activists is like how I, I say it, but, but the economics realization, I went from like three issues to like a hundred with Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Los Angeles, realizing that you can put all of that, you know, underneath economics. So yeah. that's when I started getting interested in, I guess you could say socialism. And I, and I knew about the McCarthy era and the demonization. And I learned from economist uh, Richard Wolff um, many, many things, uh, yeah, including yeah. How, how we got the New Deal, which was not from what we would now call the progressive Democrats even, let alone yeah. the, you know, the right wing. Um, we got it because of pressure. The pressure from below was the fact that we had two influential socialist parties and communist party in the 1930s that got at least a million people in the unions at that time. So that's when the CIO started, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And they could put pressure on FDR. And FDR knew they were serious. Uh, and yeah, I, and yeah. people, I don't think people understand in this country, our just most recent history, that had that not happened, we would not have Social Security. We would not have unemployment insurance, which people are living off of right now, myself included, um, because there would not have been that pressure from below because the progressive Democrats did not, they didn't even want Henry Wallace to be uh, you know, ongoing vice president because they knew he would become the president of the United States. And he was an, uh, an open socialist and pacifist. Yeah. Um, he and, was a good foreign policy guy. Like they didn't want him to go in there because he was an anti-imperialist. Like the that's whole right. sad thing about FDR is we got FDR. Okay, we got some economics in there, whatnot. Okay. We didn't get Wallace. If we got Wallace, how our foreign policy today might have looked and whatnot. But let me ask you a question, Dan. It seems very simple. You seize the means, right, of, of production. The workers sort of, do. Yeah, sort of. And so they get what they want. I mean, in today's mm -hmm. society, right? Like, okay, mm -hmm. uh, I saw a sign out that a McDonald's had a bunch of people walk out and it was shutting it down and they were closed for days. And the sign was out there uh, hiring tomorrow, $18 an hour, all because they all said, hey, you know what? We're not working for slaves wager anymore. We're going to seize the means of production and let you sit on your ass over there and just enjoy your building from the outside as it's not producing any capital for you until a point where the owners, you know, these are franchised out to individual owners. The owner put up a sign, oh shit, get people in here. $18 an hour. I don't care right now. I, I need to make something here. I can't lose my shirt. Why hasn't it worked? Uh, and it's 2021. I mean, it seems like we have the internet. We should all be more connected, more smart, more better ways to communicate and organize. Why hasn't it worked? Well, I think it's because um, people now understand more and more about how this system doesn't work for the vast majority of people and how it does work for a very small group of people. And I think the first evidence of that was why Occupy Wall Street happened in the first place in 2008 when we had the economic downturn. A lot, a lot of people lost their homes. Everything, uh, Jesus. And, yeah. and yeah, that and, and uh, pensions and whatever else, you know. And, and yet the banks claimed that they were too big to, be, uh, uh, to fail. So they got all this, these trillions of dollars, basically, and uh, Obama. Then, yeah, I know the Obama. <laughs> Thank you, Obama, Biden administration. Yeah, Biden. exactly. Okay, I don't want and, to leave George George W. Bush out. He gave a few bucks to the bank before he left office too. So that's right. And, because and, and you said in your your movies before too, uh, Clinton finished the deregulation that that Reagan started. So it's all of them, right? I don't want to leave anybody out there. Sorry, that's continue. Right. No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think, you know, Jimmy Carter is probably the only halfway decent president we've had in my lifetime, maybe JFK. 
Um, He's talking about foreign policy too. Yeah, they have, they all have their issues and they all have their yeah, problems. Yeah. But in the modern day, I mean, Occupy made it very clear. I think when uh, the banks got bailed out, they just got bigger, you know, which is the, the hope and change failed, you know, basically. And that's why, you know, over a thousand seats from national to state to local went to Republicans in 2010. People forget about that as well. You know, so it was the down downward spiral that, that got us to Trump. But I don't I don't want to get into that. But but the fact that that money was created out of nowhere, fiat money, the same thing happened in March of 2020 with the CARES Act. Only it was basically on steroids. Four trillion yeah. plus went to the owners of essential businesses. Yeah. Really, it wasn't transparent initially, but when little bits came out over time, we realized, oh, these are owners that already have multi-millions and multi-billions of dollars because we all saw how they were very slow in responding to the stimulus, which still was pathetic in the richest country in the world. And we don't even have health care. Yeah. At a time of the pandemic, you know, we don't have free health care. You know, yeah, uh, it's terrible. So the, that is proof right there that the system is failing. I mean, it doesn't really matter, to be honest with you, the ism. Um, when a system fails, it's failed. You know, Richard Wolf. I like the way Richard Wolf uh, puts it when he, uh, he said that, you know, feudalism was born, it developed, it grew, and then it passed away. Slavery, it was born, it grew, and then it passed away. Not in Libya. <laughs> why, why would we think that capitalism, which was born and it developed and grew, well, you get what I'm saying. Why would we think that that next part of the process wouldn't happen? So we've got to be, in my view, one of the reasons why I joined the DSA was, you know, I saw the potential there as I did with Occupy uh, Wall Street, Los Angeles, et cetera, at the beginning. A lot of people finally starting to understand that we need a different system because the yeah. one that's in place right now does not work. In order to do that, Bernie Sanders was right. I don't necessarily follow Bernie. I, I met him and Jane. I think they're probably good people. Um, but we have to understand we can still learn from him, you know, especially that speech. And that's why I did that, that uh, documentary about what is uh, democratic socialism and an economic bill of rights, because that speech, I thought, we you know, this is, this is important, this is historic, and I need to do an analysis of it. And along with that, then I just did a little bit of history of socialism and communism, because um, I had to make it half an hour, right, for, for TV. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, the idea of, you know, for what it was to him, in similar ways, I mean, it's for, he was very fundamental when he said, and he, when he answered that question. For me, it really is a little bit more than that. It's about, it is about creating um, an environment in our communities where we have the workers have the ownership of of the enterprises or the ownerships of the economy would be the goal eventually um yeah. and and what that would do over time is totally transform the society because you know um you would have to change the system that dominates you would because you're you're operating in the workplace much differently than the way things are done now because when you have democracy in the workplace, then people feel empowered, right? And even our founding fathers, when uh, people have, don't think about this, but capitalism was really becoming uh, a powerful force when this country was forming. So the founding fathers knew that in doing this, they needed to have a two-party system so they could have a basic, at the very least, they could have a major uh, say in what was done politically. Um, so, and these are the, the, the slave owners, right? The landowners or the land stealers and, and the slave owners, you know, that, that realized they needed to have political parties. So they set up the two party system with that in mind, right? Yeah. So they have yeah. a little bit of diversity, but not really a lot. They could maintain their positions. So now, as we build a cooperative economy, you know, where people are actually learning how to uh, work together and have one person, one vote. First, of all, I probably should go into the definition of worker-owned cooperatives or worker self-directed enterprises, which are different. Yeah. 
other I want to before we get into that. Let, let me stop you. I have some questions because let's, I want to. I want to take this slow. I want to unpack this. If we got to have you on the show a couple times, Dan, we'll have you on the show a couple times. But let's take this slow because uh, it gets deep. Because I think, really, to tell you the truth, one of the things I used to say in 2016 is that we need free education to teach you conservatives the definition of socialism and communism. Because I think you got it right, wrong. A lot of people will say, well. Capitalism really hasn't failed. And in fact, socialism's failed and has had spawned authoritarian dictators all over the world. Capitalism, unfortunately, in the United States has turned to crony capitalism and they're taking advantage of the system, the 1%. If we can stop the crony capitalism, we can still have capitalism and capitalism can thrive. And you have a whole generation of my mother who you know, was able to, her, her father, my grandfather was able to sweep the docks, buy a house with that salary, go away on vacation twice uh, for two weeks a year, send four kids to college, and then retire comfortably and die in a bed, a hospital bed. Uh, and they thrived in the capital system. My partner, Fiorella and Johnny, her, their parents came over from Peru, went, went to work hard, uh, was able to buy a house, build a, build a livelihood because of capitalism. So you still have a lot of people who say, well, capitalism is just, we have to stop the crony capitalism, but then they don't identify we have parts of socialism in our, in our government already with social security, parks, roads, the whole nine yards. Everybody loves that shit, right? Is it possible to have a way in the 21st century to have a hybrid of sorts? Of communism or capitalism or are you a purist like a lot of dsa members who say no capitalism must be stricken well well personally there's there's a difference between you know what will unfold which none of us can predict and what we would like to see right it's not yeah. always the same thing uh and also too you're right about the educational part boy do we need a lot of education i realized i was to be honest with you, I was extraordinarily humbled at Occupy Los Angeles, the people that I, I met and what I learned. Um, I took a whole week or two just to kind of try to sort it out and figure out where I belonged. Um, that should have been but, a party, by the way. That should have, they, like what the Tea Party did, I wish Occupy Wall Street did what they did instead of trying to join the Democratic Party, but go ahead. But that's it, another, it's a great believe moment, me, so. I, I, I could write a book about that. We could talk about that again another time, too. <laughs> another show. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm part of that history, even in someone's book. So, um, but the, you know, to, to the idea of authoritarianism, yes, there is definitely there is the, there's the authoritarian governments right now that call themselves socialist and communist. Um, but I also have to talk about the United States. Crony capitalism, I think, is an incorrect term. Um, number one, let's go back to the past. You could say, well, crony capitalism is what destroyed the economy that caused the crash in 1929. So. FDR literally is on record having said that his greatest achievement was not the New Deal, it was saving capitalism. Oh, so yeah. so there, there was, they did stop or at least slow down the growth of cronyism uh, at that point. But I think the mistake that FDR made was not taking it further and realizing maybe this is a sign that we should change this system because he was benefiting from it. He didn't want to change the system. But they did stop the cronyism. And yeah. lo and behold, you know, 2007, 2008, we're right back there again, technically, yeah. you know, and it's just getting worse. So, oh, yeah. so that's why I say, you know, cronyism is the problem. I don't think so. I think the problem is the system is just designed to go this way because there's an economic crisis or so every seven years of some kind. Um, and then also to um, talk about the United States, then I'll get to China and Russia. The United States, I think we have, and I, I like what Sheldon Woolen, the philosopher had to say, uh, to, uh, he, uh, Chris Hedges interviewed him a, a few years back before he passed away. He defined, defines or defined our system as inverted totalitarianism. So by that it's comparing um, the United States to the, the 1930s, 40s in Italy, um, where Mussolini was the dictator. Uh, basically, he told the corporations, this is how it's going to be done. Uh, well, now it's the other way around in the United States. Corporations it's, tell us what, yeah, exactly. In yeah. Lit, as much as we may not want to admit it, even Trump, they tell Trump, here's how it's going to go down, or Biden or, or Kamala, whoever, right? 
Yeah. Um, that's how it works. So that's the true definition of fascism, by the way, is when the states and the corporations merge. So that's right. And you should know when you're here. Absolutely. <laughs> Benito Mussolini. Well, you know, I'm Southern Italian. We didn't like Benito Mussolini, but I don't want to get into that. Keep going. Yeah. Dan. <laughs> But that's, yeah. but, but that's my point is that when people say that they're authoritarian governments, yes, but we are living in one. We're just, it's just a different kind, right? Yeah. Um, and we don't have a Putin. We have, um, you know, corporations. Yeah, and, we have a Bezos. We have a, you know, Warren Buffett. We have all these other guys. We have all these Coke bank and owners mess. and gas owners and mm -hmm. just terrible. They, they call all the shots, it seems, and we don't really have a say. So, yeah. Exactly. And, and so when in analyzing what's going on, you know, even historically speaking, I, I like uh, using the USSR in China. The USSR was a failed experiment. Let's get real. And that does stand for United uh, Soviet Socialist Republic. It, it, is, it was a socialist experiment that failed. They used the word communist to kind of separate themselves from everyone else because that was the term that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels came up with in their analysis of where you get to. But the pure form of communism is nothing that we have really seen on this planet yet, right? According to Marx and Engels. Yeah. Um, but, but do you really think it failed, Dan? Do you? I mean, we, we got a lot of lessons on the growth of the USSR. We got a lot of lessons. And even though Stalin was kind of you know, his authoritarian ways and he killed many people, his desire and his goal, and I think why he held it together for so long, was his desire to get rid of poverty and move the smallest, the most oppressed people, the most in need up out of the, the mud and out of the ashes, almost like what China has done too as well. I'm right, sorry. Exactly. No, yeah. no, it's you're yeah. good, a good point because it's, it's a mixed bag, as I like to say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, because Stalin also, you know, was part of the Allied forces that stopped Hitler and the Nazis. And people forget about that. And that was taught to us in history class. You know, uh, so yes. Well, was, they made it look like we helped out Stalin. And really, to tell you the truth, Russia lost more millions of millions of men uh, and women, in fact, but a lot of soldiers just died on the front lines fighting for uh, Russia and whatnot, more than any other country. It was, I think it was Russia one, China two, you go all the way down to the bottom. I think we lost maybe a million people, but I think Russia lost close to 40 million uh, soldiers. It was ridiculous. It, yeah. it was. And, and so there's a mix, again, it's a mixed bag. And China yeah. is a mixed bag. China's a mixed bag now too, because, um, and this is an interesting tie in to Stalin, because their goal right now is like Stalin, uh, one of their main goals is to get rid of it, what they call extreme poverty in China, which they've had. In the yeah. last 30 years, they managed to move at least, think about that, this is like a third of their population, 600 million some people out of extreme poverty. And I use those words very uh, specifically because here in the US, we can't even fathom what that even means. They also, in over just a little over a decade, created an amazing high-speed rail system throughout their entire country. And that's a large landmass. You know, we have a hard time getting the gold line expanded in two years. <laughs> True. You know? I, know, I know, right? It's like, why can't I get to Vegas in an hour? <laughs> why, yeah, right? <laughs> but no, sorry. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's create a high-speed rail to Bakersfield. That's what everybody wants. Uh, sorry, I love well, how about like, let's get it from, from Orange County to Vegas. Let's give the money up front and then pull the contract and let the people keep the money. Diane Feinstein's husband. Don't want to talk about that either. Sorry. Oh, no, that's a whole but capitalism, bagel. right, baby? Please. It, it is. It is. Yeah. And, and see, and, the, and they also have a comparable uh, AI program to ours. It might even be better now. Um, so don't get there, Dan. You're gonna you, you, know, you start talking AI, you're gonna get my audience buzzed up and stuff. That's yeah, that's a whole nother don't but go see, the there, thing, man. But it's a mixed bag, is what I'm saying. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah they, I, they I, have, I mess with you. And they have private capitalism be, that we allowed to happen. Uh state capitalism is is the predominant capitalism that they have, and that can be associated with what's called communism because of how the planning is set up, by the yeah. way. People that work for state capitalist companies get paid better and they get better benefits than the private ones. So just FYI, I had a, I can't uh, give you the specifics, but 
somebody that I had opportunity to work with in one of my jobs here, um, a Chinese young man, worked for Apple. He was sent to one of those factories. Um, I'm not sure what city it was. And uh, he told me specifically that he was he could live like a king there. They drove him around in a limousine. He said, he said, here in California, I'm making 15 bucks an hour, but they're driving me around in a limousine. I live in this beautiful uh, condominium. And he said, I saw the nets on the building. You know, and it just, it, when somebody gives you an eyewitness account of things, you know, it's, it's true. So the, the nets on the building? The, the nets on the building, on the Apple is, building. Is that to make sure people don't jump out and kill themselves or? Correct. And so this and is where? This is in China. Okay. But it's Apple. And I, maybe I shouldn't say that, but, um, you know, uh, you can edit this out if you need to. But No, 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 but, not at all. But, but the thing about it is, is this is private capitalism. And so the, the bottom line, the reason why I think capitalism is failing, and I don't know if we can save it, I honestly don't know, is because it's now ingrained in so many people's minds that profits have to be more important than people. You know, and it's not true. I always, I got this from the Bernie uh, 16 campaign. I don't remember that, yeah. yeah. And people over profits is, that is the reality of what we need. And we can't get there without another system, I, I don't think. Okay, so let's shift right into, let's put mutual aid on the back burner. Let's talk about co-owner, co-ops. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, owner, what do you, how do you define an owner co-ops? Well, there's two different ways I would put it. Um, and, okay. and ex because this is the alternative to capitalism, right? I think it is, but but yeah. also so there's explain. a- there's Because a, I think people hear socialism, they get scared. When you said that other word, it's just, oh, that sounds so beautiful. Say it again for us, Dan. The worker-owned cooperatives or worker- Oh, one more time. Worker-owned cooperatives. You hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Worker-owned cooperatives. Why do we got to work for the man? Let's work for ourselves. Give us a little explanation about that. It's beautiful. Well, basically what it is, is that um, there's a little bit of history of it too. But what it is basically is where the workers are the owners. So in other words, you have, um, and Karl Marx talked about the relationships of, you know, like um, owners and, and uh, you know, workers or employees and, and uh, em employers and employees. Well, that's what we have in, our, in the capitalist system. That's one of the things that Karl Marx analyzed. And so instead of in a, in a regular top-down capitalist corporation, in a worker-owned uh, corporation, you would have, a, at, at the current time, we have to kind of keep the system as it is because that's where we are, but you have one person, one vote, right? So in other words, in, in addition to doing the regular job that you would do, whether it's being a baker or an IT person or a media person or a teacher or a doctor, or factory worker, blue, blue collar, whatever, white collar, in addition to that job that you do, you also would be an owner. So you would be like the equivalent of the board of directors of the corporation. So in this case though, you have, you're one person with one vote. And, and if you decide to have a share, you can have one share, um, which is the same as the CEO, basically. So yeah. you, he has one vote too, and you have, uh, as, as worker owners, you decide what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and, and what to do with the profits or the surpluses, as I like to call it. And that, because that's exactly what the board of directors do, let's say, in any corporation that you would be working for, you know? Yeah. You have board of directors, nobody knows who they really are unless you bother to look at those things. They might send you in the mail once in a blue moon, particularly, you know, if there's a lawsuit going on. Then you, may, then you might see some of those people, but it could be anywhere from like, it's usually like, you know, you take an, a corporation like, like Amazon, they probably have 50 people in their board of directors, um, maybe a hundred now because Bezos has got so much money, he wants to spread it out a little bit. Um, yeah. They make all the most important decisions, every single one of them, including what the, the hours are gonna be, let's say in Bessemer, Alabama, you know, they yeah. decide, okay, this is what the hours are going to be there. And this is how much, this is the most money that we're going to pay you per hour. Here's yeah. what we're going to, you know, this, these are part of the processes, what benefits yeah. we're going to give you or not give you. 
and their decisions are set up so they make as much money as as possible and not really give two shits about the workers down below. Let's be honest. That's also the model system of capitalism right now. Is they 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 yeah. What's they that? Say they, they say they care. They do. <laughs> but they really care about their stock prices and their stockholders and their, you know, the people who are really holding the receipts. They don't really care about the guys producing the product. Let's be honest. Or the that's girls right. producing the product. I don't want to leave it the out. So. That's right. And, and that's why, you know, if you have a society full of worker-owned cooperatives, it Do we have any examples of those, Dan, by the way? I want to stop you right. Do we have, I heard there's something called the Metadon Corporation, I think, in it's Spain. Mon, it's called Montorgon. And, yeah, uh, I've heard Dick Wolf talk about it, so. Yeah, yeah Montorgon. I try, I try to have a Spanish accent. <laughs> uh, Say it one more time. Montorgon. <laughs> Say it for the yeah. for the people in Arkansas to understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fee and Johnny would know how to pronounce it right, right? Mon I know, right? Better than we could. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's spelled, you know, people, some people will say it's like Mon Dragon. When you hear that, like, okay, you don't know. It's kind Mon of Dragon. Like, yeah. Like yeah. here in California, when I when new people come here and they say, I went down Sep La Vida Boulevard and down, I went to down to like Jala. You're like, you know, Sepulveda. <laughs> yeah, you haven't lived here very long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the Montorogon, it started in the 1950s by this Catholic priest. His name is Father Erismendi Ariata. I just don't know how to roll the R there. And he, uh, it, and if people know the history there is Spain, Christian Francisco Franco was there at that time. And they had come out of a Spanish Civil War as well as World War II. So the poor areas were really devastated. And the Basque region in the north part of Spain was really hit hard, right? Because that's mm -hmm. kind of like in the mountains and they kind of like do their own thing even to this day. Well, Father Arismende said, you know, if we wait for the government to come to us, this is a very well-known quote there in, in the, that area. If we wait for the government to come to us and help us out, we'll be dead. So he said, so he started the Arismende um, University and he started training some of the people there how to think in terms of being worker owners. Now, 2021, last I checked, they have at least like 80,000 some worker owners. They still have employees um, that people that don't want to commit to being worker owners because that is there is additional responsibility there. You and I'm going through a training myself to learn how successful people have actually been doing it for decades, um, which I can get into another time too. But that that uh, corporation now it, it's an association of corporations. Um, and they have a bank, they have a university, they have factories, they have stores over, I think about 200 some organizations and companies together. And they uh, have one person, one vote for the decisions being made in the company, correct? Yeah, so in other words, instead of like, let's say Amazon has even 100 people who are the board of directors, um, Montregon's uh, board of directors would technically be every single one of the worker owners, which is over 80,000 in the board yes. of directors. Technically, right? Because that's still the system that we have, unless people decide they want to change that. And that's the beauty of a sociocratic system within a worker cooperative is that you can decide to change that at any time. So yeah. if this, if so, if your society changes because, in, like here in the United States, we we have what probably we have th probably thousands of cooperatives, but there's different types. Um, let's say you know. We have millions of businesses, small and large, that turn into cooperatives. Johnny, we will have a different society. People will start saying, you know, maybe this system really does need to change and the way that we do everything needs to change. But that we're, we're talking about something that takes time, you know, which because- Well, how do we make the transition, Dan? How do we start today in the modern world in the United States to start making the transition? I think there's there are some- positive things right now that could really help us out. The fact that we have cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which could take away the power from the central banks and whatnot. Uh, and it's almost transferable everywhere in the United States right now through every bank when it comes to Bitcoin. So we have another monetary system we can kind of lean on instead of saying, hey, we don't got to play by your rules anymore. But how do we make the transition in the workplace in the United States? What would be the process of starting to really build a a, a, a co-op uh, or more co-ops within the United States and make them big to crush the big boys. Well, I think it's, 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 it's all about, well, you know, we're social creatures, yeah. you know, so we have to participate in relationship building for one thing. 
And that's at the fundamental base. That's really where it starts. You know, you so just that's why they did COVID to keep us apart. That could be. Um, <laughs> you know, I, that's another conversation. That was a joke, everybody. I don't... <laughs> so, <laughs> we are the family. Um, oh shit, right? Like yeah, we're supposed to be. <laughs> we were breaking bread together, Dan. Now I haven't seen your face except on a screen in over a year. It's terrible. <laughs> it is terrible. I mean, well, yeah, there, there's there's certainly a lot that we could talk about there too, but but yeah, the I think you know what I'm doing from my own experience is I tried to put together a media cooperative a few years back, to, uh, Craig, yeah. and, and it, we didn't know what we were doing, and there were several other cooperatives here. One that I really liked a lot, uh, which was called you know it was a coffee shop down in uh, the Long Beach area. Great people, but it just things sometimes you know they just don't work out. And you know you have to really know about the process of how to organize that kind of a thing. It's not as simple as as uh, you know the majority vote, right? Uh, sociocracy means basically when you incorporate that in the process, everybody gets a voice because guess what? The majority uh, percent, percentage can change because of one person's idea. You might go, oh. I didn't think about that. Well, maybe yeah, I'm yeah. going to re reconsider my vote on this. So that's why it, it really requires getting to know people, right? And I also discovered that um, the DSA was interested in those kinds of things. And there's people that uh, within the organization, I won't say everyone, because that would yeah. not necessarily be true. Yeah. People have the leadership sucks, but that's okay. Go ahead. You didn't say yeah. that I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's, the thing about it is you can go into any organization and, you know, I don't agree with myself 100% of the time because I'm trying to leave a part of my brain open for learning. Yeah, I mean, but DSA, you know, you know they, they, they have quibbled or fallen apart on their main issues. Their lack of support and seeing the way they acted on forced to vote was terrible. It was awful. It really said a lot about DSA. And I don't want to get into that right, right. now, too, as well, because right. limited time, I want to stay where we're on. But please because I want to get into a few things. I want to talk about the criticism of socialism, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about mutual aid. So finish up on how we can kind of get this rolling here in the United States. You're talking about we need to get out there, talk to each other more, understand each other more, be social creatures, and then get into the mutual aid part, because I think it's important to talk about mutual aid as far as being a link to socialism. Go ahead. Right. And, and, and that is, again, relationship based. And as you get to know people, you say, um, well, here's what I need help with, or what can I help you with? Yeah. Uh, and there is a group within DSA that, that's participating in that. There are, are groups everywhere. If you didn't want to join the DSA, there's other you, you can Google mutual aid and you can you can find other groups that are out there, particularly in the big cities. There are people that are very interested in this, and this goes uh, across party lines. This is not, and even that, you know, because something is called the democratic socialist, it's, it's not necessarily democratic party, and it's not necessarily socialist in the, the traditional way that people have been taught that is usually wrong. Um, so, and also to keep in mind that you can, it's about the relationship. So as you get to know people, you realize, oh, well, you don't fit into this box or this definition that I thought you did. You know what I mean? And it's like when you do your homework, you know, as we all have to do, you realize, oh, this, this is, wow, this person's interesting. Or this person has some things going on here that I need to learn more about myself. And so as we do that, then we can build these networks because that's what they are, you know? And then as you do that, you can, and you learn, let's say about the, just the fact that worker owned cooperatives exist to say, well, hey, you and I do the same kind of thing. Maybe we can talk about doing, you know, some kind of a, of a project together. And then you can start maybe by learning certain things. And as you get to know one another and you get more comfortable with people, you say, you know, why don't we start our own business together? Because we don't know where this economy is going, especially now with what's going on in 2021. You know, so I think that's why it's accelerated within different groups that I've been associated with here in the Los Angeles area. Now I'm participating in trainings with Arizmendi Association of Cooperatives in the Bay Area, uh, because they're reviewing three or four different people uh, to be owners. They're already workers, and they're they're going through the processes, you know, the trainings and all that. And and some of us have been invited in to that process. You know what I mean? 
And then that's awesome. Like, and yeah. and so we're actually seeing they've uh, Ares Mendes, a CEO, is is, a, is an attorney, right? So yeah. um, he's invited us in, and now he I'm I know him, and he knows me, and he knows you know what I do. So um, it, that expands the network. And and we were talking at the just the other day actually in our the meeting that we were invited into at the end, he talked to me about some things, and he said, you know, we really do need to grow the number of cooperatives in this country. Um, yeah. So in that sense, we need to uh, help each other out. The reason why they don't, there aren't more of them. There's two different basic reasons. There's probably more, but I think um, one of them is that the people just aren't motivated to learn, to take the time to learn this process, to learn how to do this, or to take the time to develop relationships with like-minded people. Um, yeah. And which is, you know, I'm, it's, I have improvements on all of this myself. So I understand that. Um, but the other thing I think really is the system. When you have people that are in charge, they don't want that to change. And so yeah, yeah, totally. they, will, you know, they don't, even though uh, Montlodragon in Spain has proved, has proven that cooperatives are very competitive in the current system that perpetuates competition. And yeah. they, they don't like that. So they would prefer people not knowing about it. You know, that's yep. where it starts. If they, if they make you invisible, then you don't exist. But exactly. Yeah. But, but eventually let's, that changes. Yeah. All right. So let's leave that part there. Let's talk a little bit about mutual aid before we get on to the final questions, because we got to keep a good time for people to watch this. We don't want to give them too much at one time. Right. I like to slowly feed people the information to let them digest it before we go on to the next part. And believe you me, Dan, I'll have you back on. We'll, we'll talk about this stuff. We'll have great conversations. Uh, Always about great conversation. how we keep moving this forward. I, I love you, brother. Uh, I've Likewise. loved you since I met you. You're an amazing person. Uh, even with that alien mask on your face and when you're jumping around <laughs> going crazy, I still see the I, st I still see the genius in you. So let's talk about mutual aid because a lot of people, they will talk about mutual aid without even mentioning socialism, communism, capitalism. They'll talk about this beautiful thing which kind of ties into the whole thing where it's like, we need, we get, we need to know each other. We need to know right. what we need. And if we need both need two different things, then maybe we can help each other with those things. Talk about what mutual aid really is. Cause I think that is at the core of socialism. Go ahead. Well, mutual aid is when if it's based on need. Right? Yeah. And there, there is a distinction between need and want. And I think a lot of times maybe we don't know how to you know, distinguish between the two. And yeah. mutual aid will force you to do that if you're serious about it. So you say to yourself, okay, and it's a humbling experience. It's a humbling experience to admit to oneself that, hey, you know what? And I, I say that from somebody that has a lot of experience with that. It's hard for me to say help. You yeah. know, and there have been a couple of times, you know, in my life where I've had traumatic experiences and I've had, I had to literally get to the point where help I don't know what to do here. I really, you know, and I had to reach out to family and friends eventually got it figured out, uh, took a while. And that's a long story in itself. Uh, but uh, that is something that each and every one of us has uh, experiences with in some way or another. We all have needs, right? Other than, you know, the basic ones that we all, we understand. Um, food and, you know, clothing, shelter and that kind of stuff. Um, and I think most everybody wants to be productive. So to be better at what you do, um, that's where relationship building is important. So it's based on need. And you basically, in that process, you know, well, what in, in a mutual aid context, let's say of, of DSA, what would you say in the overall picture people need? And how of course, that was how to, well, one of the th projects that, that, uh, we've been working on is um, healthcare. Yeah. How do you navigate through this healthcare system? So there's some I, some people have done some incredible work, research, putting together these documents. Um, you know how this is in California, how you go through the healthcare process. Here's what your choices are. Here's what you need to do. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but can you can you give us an example of mutual aid on a smaller level though too as well because helping people they need they need health care right we still have to get them we have to buy into our capitalist system to get that health care whatnot is there a different more 
a, a, a lower or smaller form of mutual aid in which we can give examples to about how this whole thing gets started. Because let's say we were in a, a, a town and there's a doctor who's there with us and we started our own commune and that doctor needs food. And I'm a chef and I can cook for him food and then he can give me his services. But that's not gonna happen in, in, in our system right now. I mean, obviously not. I mean, the doctor doesn't need us to have make food. He gets paid millions of dollars. Can you give an example of how mutual aid starts on a smaller level? You know what, I think a great example uh, that we should see more and more of, to be honest, is the community garden. Okay. It, you know, if people um, realize that, hey, you know, we should have, you know, more sources for, you know, getting access to food locally. Um, that is something that somebody might have a plot of land. Somebody might ha have the time to do the work, you know, in the garden. Somebody might ha have, time, have the skill to plant because it is a skill. I mean, I would have to have somebody show me how to plant. I mean, I think I, I know the basic idea, but I, but I also know, you know, I have to learn this stuff because I couldn't keep a cactus alive once. I mean, so. I know I'm bad at it too. <laughs> <laughs> I got a plant dying out front. I can't figure out how to keep it, you know, but I can cook it if you give it to me. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. See, and that's why, you know, when the time comes to have a, a meal, then, hey, I know a perfect chef especially if you like Italian recipes, you know what I mean? So it's, it's that kind of thing where you start talking to people and you start saying, well, hey, I know this person, I know that person. And you, you, you create this network, right? And that's essentially mutual aid on the ground starts that way, just like you would make your friends, right? Yeah. Um, that's the, the importance of activism is that just like with BSA or any group, Occupy uh, Los Angeles or Feel the Burn, part one and part two, um, you, you start meeting people, you know, that you never probably would have met otherwise. And when you do that, not only do you make new friends, but you realize, oh, there's commonalities here. And as we get further and further down the road here, I think mutual aid is going to play a much bigger role than it already has, because I don't see this economy recovering anytime soon for the vast majority of people. When yeah. you have, I've got statistics here from Davos and or for Oxfam or whatever, that just would, it's just shocking, you know, how much the, the wealth and, and income is just keeps getting more and more consolidated at the top. It's just, this can't yeah. continue. I guarantee you, this is not sustainable, right? Even, even the people who are on the comfortable level need to understand, like my mother, I tell her all the time, I mean, mom, take a few bucks, buy some land, buy something that you could you can actually fiscally have and stuff like that because your dollar uh, and your market has been overbought and oversold like 240 times than it's actually worth. It's all built on speculation and the whole walls are going to come crumbling down. And those people who are just comfortable in the middle, uh, the people at top, when the dollar falls, they'll still be able to survive. They'll have the assets. They'll have control of the resources. They'll have enough of the monetary system where it won't affect them and their way of living. But those people in the middle, forget about it. And the people on the bottom, then it just falls out and we're storming the castle. Let me ask you just one last question right now, uh, because we need to get out of here because we're, we're running short on time. But I, I want to talk today, one criticism of socialism. Next time we'll have a show, we'll end the show with another criticism of socialism. This is one of the criticisms of socialism I hear all the time. Socialism suppresses competition. It's not like capitalism, where capitalism thrives with competition. It actually incentivizes competition. And that lack of co uh, competition with socialism creates a lack of creati creation and creativity with the mind. Your thought on that? Well, I think, I, I think that could be easily debunked, don't you? I mean, uh, because there's this thing called deregulation um, yeah. or when there's monopolies, uh, how is there competition when monopolies uh, are created because of deregulations? I mean, that was, we, we saw that with the banking industry. When we have a very recent example of that at the end of the, of the Bill Clinton administration, one of the last bills was um, to create all these, these types of investments in the stock market that created the crash basically, uh, you know, seven years later, preceded by the final nail in the Glass-Steagall regulation of Wall Street, uh, which began, you know, in the 1930s with the Banking Act. Oh, you yeah. know, um, and so over time, little by little, you know, it was eviscerated and finally it was completely eliminated. And it just, 
Same thing with the Telecommunications Act of 1996. I mean, all the stuff that was done previously to do that very thing you're talking about, it was undone. So tell me how that's a successful system. I don't, I, I can't, I personally can't wrap my brain around it. Once I started wrapping my brain around it, I thought, wait a minute, this is, these are contradictions. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, I can say, you know, um, all kinds of things, but that doesn't mean that that's actually what's happened. You know, actions yeah. speak louder than words. You know, like I was saying, you know, these, these uh, companies can say, oh yeah, we care about people, but at the end of the day, it's profits. That's really the most important thing behind closed doors. They, they of course, they're not going to say that publicly. You know how unpopular yeah. that would be, you know. But oh, that course. is the reality of it yeah. because that's what we've seen, yeah. right? Well, next show we'll talk about how socialism sometimes, how a lot of people feel, like my mom and my other friends and stuff. And it's so funny to hear people like I have some conservative friends that are like in the Midwest. They're like, we're at bars, we're talking. They try to stop us from doing this. We don't have any mask on or whatnot and stuff. I'm like, yeah, you guys are kind of morphing towards a more socialistic environment where you're going to talk to each other, talk about mutual aid, talk about bringing those things together. I think this conversation needs to continue to go on. I think we had a great show today, Dan. Can uh, I we'll mention pick this one up. more thing? One more thing. You can finish up with your last thought go right ahead yeah because you, you were talking about a uh, public health and safety crisis which we are obviously in right now yeah is you you could say it's a it's a crisis of the system because we weren't prepared for it at yeah. all you know if we were prepared for it we would have had hospital beds we would have had the masks in surplus we would have had surpluses of all the things that you need to get through a crisis like this we didn't have and if yeah. we'd had those things, we probably would be relatively sort of normal right now. Well, um, there's an argument too as well that our overlords, our technological overlords also suppress conversation about this where maybe right. we didn't need masks. We had other forms of treatment and we didn't open up those books because we do have an authoritarian system right now where the tech overlords suppress speech, they suppress conversations. They didn't let us look at other alternatives. They said, you have to take it this way or the highway. And that was it. You know what I'm saying? And there's some of us out there who didn't like that. And it made us more suspicious of this whole situation, too, as well, uh, Mr. Now. It's, yeah. it's the yeah. divide, and, divide and conquer thing. Is, is Oh, yeah. There's, there's, they got it. They got us divided right now. And they're just trying to finish putting the sword completely through us. Dan, uh, thank you so much for joining the show. Let's do this again soon. I think this was the good baby step. I think if you, you hit out a lot of good points, uh, I still think it's going to be really hard to convince a lot of those old school people to go to a more socialistic kind of environment. But I think they would, I, I like to point out the fact that we already have a quasi socialistic system uh, and it can just be, we can build upon the positive things of doing things together with co-ops and mutual aid and whatnot. Uh, yeah, and I'm yeah, thankful yeah. that you're leading the way. Thank you. I like the the idea of I, I I would rather even use the word cooperative system, cooperative society. I, I would rather call it that. But we definitely we need to do that. We need to because they hear the system. S word, they go running for the trees, Dan. I know, I know exactly. And they that get and over time, people can learn, and and it can you know it can have a less uh, impact like that. But I think in the meantime, cooperative systems, cooperative society, you know, uh, worker owned cooperatives, mutual aid, helping each other out. That uh, makes it simpler to understand in the transition. But we, I think everybody realizes, even the most conservative people, we've got to do something else. This is not working. Agreed. Thank this you. This is Pastor Jardula from the Convo Couch, Dan Nicewinder, a la Dan uh, Nauman is what I call him. Go check him out. Check out his page. He's got a lot of YouTube stuff out there. We appreciate y'all listening. We'll speak to you later. Uh, a conversation about socialism versus capitalism. Convo out. Thank you so much.